Welcome to History 111, Lecture 34, Westward Expansion. Manifest Destiny was an idea that really caught on during the 1840s in the United States, and this is a belief that it was America's God-given right and duty to expand West Pacific Coast. And the Manifest Destiny is often described in terms of expressing superiority of what they refer to as the American race. And remember that American race is going to exclude Native Americans, Mexicans, and basically anyone who's not white. Now, some of the roots of the American expansion are going to lie a little earlier on, and first we need to look at Texas. Now, in 1821, there are only about 4,000 Tejanos living in Texas, and Tejanos are people of Spanish ancestry who consider Texas their home. Now, the Spanish government is going to try to attract more settlers to Texas, but very few are going to come. Now, Moses Austin, who is an American, is given permission by the Spanish government to start a colony in Texas, and all the Americans had to do was follow Spanish laws. Now, in 1821, Mexican independence happens, and Moses Austin also dies. Now, the Mexican government told Stephen Austin, his son, that the settlers could still come on three conditions. They had to become Mexican citizens, convert to the Roman Catholic Church, and learn Spanish. Now, the colony established by Stephen Austin is very successful and attracts more Americans to settle there. And some are looking for a new way of life, others are looking to escape the law, and some are looking for chances to grow rich. And by 1830, there were 30,000 settlers there, and now Americans outnumber the Tejanos 6 to 1. Now, in 1829, the Mexican government went ahead and outlawed slavery, and the settlers that were there want to keep their slaves so they can grow cotton, and that's causing a dispute between them and the government. And they're also not particularly keen on learning Spanish or following Mexican laws, and very few had set, converted to Catholicism. So all the things that they were expected to do and all the conditions that were given before they settled are really not being followed by them. So as a result of these disputes, in 1829, the Mexican government closed the state to further American immigration, and Texans were being now required to pay tax for the first time. And the president of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, is going to send more Mexican troops to Texas to try to keep order and try to enforce these rulings. And Texans increasingly begin to talk about breaking away from Mexico. Now, when Stephen Austin is jailed, the Texans revolt, and Santa Ana leads about 6,000 troops to Texas to put this down. Now, the revolt goes on, and there's a number of battles fought, and... Importantly, in some of these battles, the Mexican army had executed a number of Texans, and that really had them riled up. And so when they met at Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto, they attacked with a particular ferocity, and the battle was over within 18 minutes with more than half of the Mexican army killed. Now, at that point, Santa Ana is forced to sign a treaty giving Texas its independence, and now it becomes its own country for a little while. In 1836, Texas becomes known as the Lone Star Republic and it elects Sam Houston as president. Now, some Americans want Texas to become part of the United States, but some people are afraid of Texas becoming a slave state, while others are afraid that if Texas joins the United States, it might provoke a war with Mexico. Now, another important territory people are looking at this time is the Oregon Territory, and who owned it became a major international issue in the 1840s. Now, both Britain and the United States had claimed a territory based on discoveries in the 1790s, but they had agreed on a joint occupation, with the idea being to settle the border later. Now, nor neither side had any significant settlements by 1840. But it's at this time that Americans start to flood westward, and Americans are going to soon overwhelm the British population and decimate native settlements. And once Americans are firmly established there, they begin to pressure the government to take possession of the territory as a whole. Now, this is all going to become an issue in presidential elections. In 1840, the country still distracted in large part due to the Panic of 1837, and there are some issues about banking involving Tyler getting thrown out of the Whig Party, but when it comes to the 1844 election, it's all about Texas. Now, the Whigs basically oppose expansion and nominate Clay, and Texas splits the Democrats, who pass over Van Buren for Polk, and Polk really strongly favors the expansion. He's mainly supported by the South, and the South really hopes this will become a slave state. So Tyler arranges the Texas annexation before he leaves office, but after the election. So that already gets settled before Polk comes into office. So Polk goes ahead, being a strong expansionist, and forces the Oregon issue. Now Polk is going to propose a permanent boundary at the 49th parallel, but Britain refuses. So Polk turns around and threatens war if the boundary is not set at 5440, and the British back down and accept the original proposal. 
Now, by March 1845, Congress had already approved the annexation, it was already a done deal, and at this point in time, we should realize that the president doesn't take office until March. It's later that we shift it back to January. That's for reasons we'll talk about in History 112. But during this time period, March is when they take office, and Texas annexation was already something in progress. So the Republic of Texas really hoped it would solve its, all of its different financial and military problems, and they become the 28th state in December. Now, Mexico is going to react to all this by cutting diplomatic ties to the United States. Now, when the United States takes possession of Texas, it's going to claim that the Rio Grande River marks the southern border of the territory, and that was something the Republic of Texas has always claimed. The Mexican government, however, rejects this idea and argues that the southern border is the Nueces River. And here we can see the two on the map, and what we can see is the Republic of Texas is a smaller piece of Texas in the east, and Depending on which river is used, you can see how it cuts off more than half of Texas territory. So in 1845, the president is going to go ahead and order U.S. troops to be dispatched to the disputed border region, and Polk claims that he's doing this to protect Texas from possible uh, Mexican attack. Now at the same time, Polk is going to send diplomats to Mexico City to negotiate the purchase of California and New Mexico, offering $30 million, but the Mexican officials refuse to meet with U.S. diplomats. Now, in March of 1846, the General in Command, General Taylor's troops, are going to make camp at the Rio Grande River, and they're going to be inside, well inside the disputed territory. Now, in 1846, the Mexican commander insists that the United States troops must move from the area, but Taylor refuses to, to go. So Mexican forces cross the Rio Grande and attack a, group, a small group of 63 soldiers. And in May 1846, Polk addresses Congress stating that Mexico has shed American blood up upon American soil. As a result of that, Congress debates and declares war on Mexico two days later. Now, there's a lot of support for the war. For many Americans, this war leads to a great sense of national pride. Many people who supported the war believed it would spread Republican values, and in particular, a lot of Southerners support the war, thinking all the territory that was won could be organized into slave states. And they had very good reason for thinking that, because the Missouri Compromise had established a line above this line, no slavery. Below the line, definitely slavery. And when they're looking at the map and what could be gained from Mexico, it's basically below the line. Now, while many people support the war, there is an opposition. A lot of the members of the Whig Party thought it was unjustified, and Northern abolitionists really feared the consequences of gaining this territory, and in particular how it might expand slavery. One of the key people who speaks up against it is a abolitionist and rising star Abraham Lincoln, who writes the Spot Resolutions in 1848 demanding that Polk show on the map where this American blood had been shed on American soil. Now, while there is opposition, ultimately it doesn't block the war itself. Now, over the course of this war, it's also going to turn in the favor of the United States, and they're going to negotiate the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 to settle the war, and that's going to set the southern boundary of Texas at the Rio Grande. The United States is also going to gain present-day states of California, Nevada, Utah, most of Arizona and New Mexico, and then parts of Colorado and Wyoming. The United States is also going to agree to pay Mexico $15 million and then pay all of Mexico's debts to American citizens. So while there's going to be a big cash payment, the United States is going to be the big winner here, gaining a huge amount of new territory. Here, if you look on the map, we can see what we're talking about here and see the areas that were gained. Not only does the United States get the disputed territory in gray settled as being its, it's also going to go ahead and get all of that yellow territory as well. So what's the big idea here? Well, first and foremost, there's this popular idea of manifest destiny, and it's thought that America must expand. So the United States is also becoming more militarily assertive. They threaten Britain over the Oregon Territory, and ultimately get their way. There's war with Mexico, which leads to a vast exchange of territory. But also at the same time, there's people in the United States questioning this, and there's some fear about the consequences of expansion, and in particular how that's going to relate to the slavery question. See you in the next lecture.